Welcome to Llandaf Cathedral to this very special day in the life of the diocese. A particularly warm welcome to those of you who have traveled distances uh, to support Rod on this special occasion. Beloved in Christ, we are here in the presence of the living God and of the whole company of heaven to offer to him through our Lord Jesus Christ our worship, praise, and thanksgiving that we may know more truly the greatness of his love and that his grace may bear fruit in our lives. We've come to hear and receive God's holy word, to seek the strengthening power of the Holy Spirit and to pray for ourselves and all mankind that we may be given those things which are necessary for our true well-being. But first let us confess our sins and seek our Father's pardon and peace. We confess to God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. Wherefore, we pray God to have mercy upon us. Almighty God, have mercy upon us. Forgive us all our sins and deliver us from evil. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness and bring us to life everlasting. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The psalm appointed for this evening is part of Psalm 119. We sit while the choir chants the psalm.
The first lesson is taken from the 14th chapter of the book of Exodus, beginning at the fifth verse. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the minds of Pharaoh and his officials were changed towards the people, and they said, What have we done, letting Israel leave our service? So he had his chariot made ready and took his army with him. He took 600 picked chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and he pursued the Israelites who were going out boldly. The Egyptians pursued them, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots its chariot drivers and his army. They overtook them, camped by the sea, at Pai Haharioth, in front of Baal Zephon. As Pharaoh drew near, the Israelites looked back, and there were the Egyptians advancing on them. In great fear, the Israelites cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the very thing we told you in Egypt, let us alone and let us serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. But Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm and see the deliverance that the Lord will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to keep still. Then the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry out to me? Tell the Israelites to go forward. But you lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the Israelites might go into the sea on dry ground. Then I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them, and so I will gain glory for myself over Pharaoh and all his army, his chariots and his chariot drivers. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, when I have gained victory for myself over (coughs) his chariots and his chariot drivers. The angel of God, who was going before the Israelite army, moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from in front of them and took its place behind them. It came between the army of Egypt and the army of Israel. And so the cloud was there with the darkness, and it lit up the night. One did not come near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night, and turned the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. The Israelites went into the sea on dry ground, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went into the sea after them, all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and chariot drivers. At the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and cloud looked down upon the Egyptian army and threw the Egyptian army into panic. He clogged their chariot wheels so that they turned with difficulty. The Egyptians said, let us flee from the Israelites, for the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea, so that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and chariot drivers. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, And at dawn, the sea returned to its normal depth. As the Egyptians fled before it, the Lord tossed the Egyptians into the sea. 
the waters returned and covered the chariots and the chariot drivers, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained. But the Israelites walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great work that the Lord did against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord and believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. Here ends the first lesson.
The second lesson is taken from the sixth chapter of the Gospel according to St. Matthew, beginning at the first verse. Jesus said, Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them, for then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your le left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your alms may be done in secret. And your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, Go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. When you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then in this way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And whenever you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so as to show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that your fasting may be seen not by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Here ends the second lesson.
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting.
May I speak in the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. It may not surprise you to know that in anticipation of Rod's arrival into his new role, I have been asking myself through the last month or so, what is an archdeacon? What do they do? And is it any different now from when we last licensed an Archdeacon of Llandaff 11 years ago? It isn't that I'm new to Archdeacons, but for various quirks of fate, uh, I have worked with an Archdeacon, at least one, in every team I belong to for the last 37 years. So Rod is my 15th archidiaconal colleague. But if you take um, this particular current transition, there are quite a lot of changes for us in moving from Archdeacon Peggy Jackson, who we sent off into a very happy retirement in July, and Archdeacon Rod Green. The most obvious is that Rod is 25 years younger than Peggy. And a lot has happened to the church in the last 25 years. Uh, unlike Peggy, though, Rod grew up in this diocese, so his, he already has uh, some roots here. Uh, but since then, he's traveled geographically and spiritually across terrain, which is really going to help us shape the church in Wales in the next 25 years. And incidentally, uh, Rod, we're really, really glad that you brought back to Cardiff with you Joanne and Amelia and Orla and Anastasia. <laughs> so back to my question, what is an archdeacon? Um, some of my Episcopal colleagues, the bishops in Wales, have previously, unlike myself, have previously been archdeacons. And since I was locked up with them uh, and 40 other people trying to elect a new bishop for the Diocese of Swansea and Brecon for the last three days, I decided to ask uh, one of them that question, what does an archdeacon do? To which they replied, they run the diocese. Well, with all due respect to my fellow uh, bishop, I'm not sure I wholly agree. Um, firstly, um, there's a good reason why we call Rod and his inestimable colleague, Mike Comor, who read the first lesson, why we call them archdeacons. Um, hear, if you will, the significance in that title of being deacons. Uh, yes, there are administrative tasks and problems to be solved, Rod, without which the diocese would be in a mess. There are systems to be created and maintained. Uh, we do ask you to play your part in ensuring the stability and smooth running of the parishes and the diocese. But the purpose of an archdeacon surely must lie essentially in their serving ministry, their enabling of others, their care of congregations and clergy, their ability to both support and challenge, for that is the place where creative change always happens. And also saying that they run the diocese doesn't do sufficient credit in my mind uh, to the leadership that you will exercise within the diocesan team. Uh, the senior team, including the diocesan secretary, who probably thinks he has a hand in running the diocese. Yes, I can see James nodding. Um, the directors of ministry, communications and outreach, education, finance, and several key other people. Uh, you'll find that we talk a lot in our team about our shared episcopate, our shared oversight, and the success of what we do here in Llandaff, the small miracles which our church life, week by week, 
are largely achieved because we aim to continuously improve what we do in our various teams. And so it will be with you, Rod, that much of the success and faithfulness of your ministry among us uh, will be hidden from view because it will be embedded in simply getting other people to enjoy ministry, to work well together, and to be joyful in teams. So instead of what my uh, fellow bishop um, decided, let me offer you a couple of my own reflections on the role of an archdeacon. Uh, from our two glorious readings, uh, both of our readings today, old and new, um, were portraying how the Christian faith gets exercised and the hallmarks of what it is that we will ask of Rod. The Old Testament lesson was, you'll remember that stirring story of the rescue of the Israelites, the Hebrew people, out of the land of their bondage and oppression, even as they are being pursued by those who have used and abused them. It is, of course, the archetypal story of our redemption, proclaiming that God's desire for us is our liberty, the gift of living in hope, living in freedom, whatever that looks like for you. But notice how the story is told, because as the uh, 600 plus chariots of the Egyptians advance on them, fear begins to infect the people. Uh, yes, they cried out to the Lord for help, but they also doubted, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you've taken us away to die in the wilderness, they say. Uh, they distrusted Moses, the leadership that had been given to them, and they were cynical. What have you done to us? And the, one, the comment that I love from them, because it's so very familiar still, is this not the very thing we told you in Egypt? In other words, we told you this was a bad idea. Um, they despaired. Now, all of these familiar human instincts amount, if you could summarize them all in a single phrase, it would be about a failure of nerve. Moses tells them that the Lord will fight for them, and they are to go forward because God is always ahead of them. But fear undermines their confidence in him. Rod, you know that you come uh, to this diocese at a time when Christian habits, our rights and our beliefs, are diminishing in its influence in Welsh society. Uh, no longer does the church bask in the warm winds of habit and approval. Uh, we have to work a lot harder, uh, particularly amongst those who are under 50, to be even be given a hearing. But that challenge ought to excite us. Uh, it ought not to drive us to doubt and cynicism or despair. You are to help individual Christians, congregations, clergy to keep their nerve, believing that they will see the deliverance the Lord will accomplish if we go forward together. Now, our second reading was Jesus' encouragement to, deliver, to live daily in the practice of faith, and especially how we pray. As Archdeacon, we ask you to live with integrity and to help people to pray in season and out of season, to live out of faith and to encourage people to see how to do that. As Archdeacon, you will help the parishes of Llandaff to proclaim and practice faith, the resurrection faith of Jesus Christ. Measure your ministry by that alone. Are we together growing in faith? Are we Easter people? 
whose song is Alleluia and whose name is love. And then if I may say, you're to leave lots of time for cycling. Uh, those of you who are yet to get to know Rod uh, will discover he's a serious cyclist. I am not a serious cyclist. You can tell that by the big wicker basket that's on the front of my bicycle and the flat tire. There's nothing compulsive about me and cycling. However, with Rod in mind, partly, I've been paying a lot of attention to cycling this summer. Uh, some of it is thanks to the Tokyo Olympics on the TV. Uh, I started my day often in the velodrome. And some because I, I got the opportunity to watch live some of the Vuelta, the Spanish equivalent. They don't know what the Vuelta is the Spanish equivalent of the Tour de France. So let, my, uh, let me end my musings on the life of an archdeacon with two cycling images. Uh, one is that of the peloton, the way in which one cyclist, even someone as talented as our own Geraint Thomas, one person only ever succeeds thanks to the tactics and commitment of the whole body of cyclists. It's inspirational to see what can be achieved if we work for one another. So welcome to the Llandaff Peloton. And the other image is that of the Madison, where cyclists, uh, usually two, uh, work together, taking the pressure off each other. Uh, and then, uh, they often hand-sling uh, the one who's going to take the lead. In, uh, they hand-sling them forward. Um, if you didn't watch it, it was done to in fantastically great effect by Laura Kenny and Katie Archibald, who won the first, I think it was the first ever, uh, women's Madison uh, in the Olympics, and they won the gold. Um, Rod, as Archdeacon, you will often be the person who has to lead the way and go forward. But then you will hand-sling others into that way forward. They will have, because of your leadership, they will have held their nerve. They will have seen the resurrection faith of Jesus Christ. And you will propel them onto great and better things. But don't forget, there are always those around you, a great peloton of colleagues looking out for you. And if you'd like to come and sort out my flat tire, I'd be really <laughs> grateful. Rod, may you greatly enjoy being the Archdeacon of Llandaff, as we now greatly enjoy welcoming you into that calling.
Would you all please be seated? We've come together to admit and collate Roderick Green as Archdeacon of Llandaff. Before this can happen, I invite the Archdeacon designate to make the necessary legal declarations. The Church in Wales is part of the one holy Catholic and apostolic Church, worshipping the one true God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. It professes the faith uniquely revealed in the Holy Scriptures and set forth in the Catholic creeds, which faith the Church is called upon to proclaim afresh in each generation. Led by the Holy Spirit, it has borne witness to Christian truth in its historic formularies, the 39 Articles of Religion, the Book of Common Prayer, and the ordering of bishops, priests, and deacons. Rod, in the declarations you are about to make, will you affirm your loyalty to this inheritance of faith as your inspiration and guidance under God in bringing the grace and truth of Christ to this generation and making him known to those in your care. I do solemnly declare my belief in the faith which is revealed in the Holy Scriptures and set forth in the Catholic Creed and to which the historic formularies, namely the 39 Articles of Religion, the Book of Common Prayer, and the ordering of bishops, priests, and deacons, as published in 1662, bear witness. And in public prayer and the administration of the sacraments, I will use only those forms of service which are allowed by lawful authority and none other. And I hereby undertake to be bound by the constitution of the Church in Wales, and to accept, submit to, and carry out any sentence or judgment which may at any time be passed upon me by the Archbishop, a diocesan bishop, or any court or the tribunal of the Church in Wales. I promise also to uphold the dignity and honour of our Cathedral Church. I, Roderick Green, do solemnly declare that I will pay true and canonical obedience to the Bishop of Llandaff and her successors in all things lawful and honest, so help me God. Rod has to put his signature to it before I can move on. <laughs> June by divine providence, Bishop of Llandaff. Roderick Ernest Alexander Green, Bachelor of Arts, Master of Arts, Clark in Holy Orders, you have been called to work together with us as your bishop, as a pastor, priest and teacher, and to take your share in the councils of the church. Now in accordance with the constitution of the church in Wales, you have been appointed to serve God in the Diocese of Llandaff as Archdeacon of Llandaff. This document recognises that having made the declarations required in the Constitution, we have granted you a general license in the Diocese of Llandaff, authorizing you to preach the word of God, to exercise pastoral care, and to administer the holy sacraments at the invitation of the clergy in any parish in the diocese. You are fully empowered to exercise this ministry accepting its privileges and the responsibilities of a priest of this diocese. Having committed yourself to this work, do not forget the trust of those who have chosen you. Care alike for young and old, strong and weak, rich and poor. By your words and in your life, proclaim the gospel. Love and serve Christ's people nourish them and strengthen them to glorify God in this life and in the life to come. Keep before you as the pattern of your calling, Jesus Christ, who came not to be served but to serve. 
study his teaching and meditate upon it, that you may encourage his people in the way of holiness. Guided by the Holy Spirit, pray constantly that your life may be a pattern of obedience and holiness, and so reveal the power of the kingdom. May the Lord who has given you the will to do this work give you the grace and power to perform it. Given under my hand an Episcopal seal this fifth day of September in the year of our Lord 2021, in the fifth year of my consecration as bishop. Rod received my license to minister as archdeacon in this diocese and to exercise pastoral and spiritual care within the archdeaconry of Llanda. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so may we pray for Rod in his new ministry. I'm going to ask for a moment of quiet prayer as we all pray for him, for God's Spirit to bless his ministry. And then I will pray. Almighty God, give to your servant Rod grace to fulfil his ministry as Archdeacon. Give him reverence in celebrating the sacraments, faithfulness in proclaiming your word, diligence in pastoral care, tenderness in comforting, power in healing the wounds of God's people, and humility, self-sacrifice, and courage in all things. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you now and remain with you always. Amen. And so I ask uh, you all, will you support Rod in his new ministry? We will pray for Um, Rod, just before I disappear, uh, this is the authority that those people over there need in order to make you a member of the greater chapter. So you're not going to hold on to the piece of paper for very long. Okay, they'll want it any second. All right. Thank you. your rightful place in the choir of this cathedral, 
and to the duties and privileges belonging to members of Greater Chapter. May the Lord bless your going out and your coming in. So let us pray. In our prayers, we give thanks to God. We give thanks to God for calling Archdeacon Rod into our diocese. We thank God also for bringing God's family to us, for Joanne, Emilia, Orla and Anastasia. Pray for Bishop June and all clergy and people of the diocese, asking God's blessing on our mission and ministry together. We pray that Christ may be seen in the life of our church. Jesus, Lord of the church, you have called us into the family of those who are the children of God. Strengthen our love for each other as brothers and sisters by your grace. Build us into a temple where the Holy Spirit dwells. Give us clean hands and pure hearts that our lives may reflect your holiness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You have called us to be light to the world, so that those in darkness will come to you. May our lives shine as a witness to the saving grace you have given for all. You have called us to be members of your body, so that when one suffers, all suffer together. We ask for your comfort and healing power. Bring hope to those in distress. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You have called us to be the bride, where you, Lord, are the bridegroom. Prepare us day by day, step by step, for the wedding feast where we will be united with you forever in the glory of your full presence and make us one in heart and mind to serve you with joy forever lord in your mercy hear our prayer almighty god give us wisdom to perceive you intelligence to understand you diligence to seek you patience to wait on you vision to behold you, a heart to meditate on you, a life to proclaim you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
help dear people love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And we greet our patriarchs.